Hello, everyone, and welcome to Office Hours. Um, I'm Apurva from the Rebus community, um, and I'm very excited um, for our session today. I'm joined by a few representatives from the Open Education Network. I have Karen Lauritsen, who's my co-host, Barb Thies, uh, and Craig Sandler. I will quickly mention that Rebus Community, for those of you who don't know, is a charity that is based in Canada. Um, we offer programs and resources to support open publishing efforts. And we're really excited to hear from three people who have been involved in various different kinds of publishing in initiatives today. Uh, we're going to be talking about writing math and science textbooks. And um, I'll turn it over to Karen to tell you a little bit more about our topic for today and our guests. Thank you, Aperva, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here with you. I am Karen Lauritsen. I'm Publishing Director with the Open Education Network. We are a community of professionals who are working to make education more open. And as Aperva mentioned, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, creating math and science textbooks. If this is your first time at Office Hours, I'll introduce you to the format. We have three guests who are here. They will each speak for around five minutes, and then we'll really look to you for questions and conversation. We want to know um, what you need to know. So you'll have an opportunity to unmute or post your questions in chat, whichever works best for you. I will also go ahead and put a link to a form in the chat shortly, inviting you to tell us what you want to talk about at future office hour sessions. So um, help us uh, drive these conversations. So without further ado, I will introduce our three guests. We are joined by Oscar Levin. He is Associate Professor, School of Mathematical Sciences at the University of Northern Colorado. We're also joined by Amy Balia, Assistant Professor Organic Chemistry at Radford University. And we're also joined by Delmar Larson, who is Professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of California, Davis. He's also the Founder and Director of the Libertex Project. So we will start by turning things over to Oscar. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. This is very exciting. Um, I got into OER stuff um, my very first year at the University of Northern Colorado. I taught a discrete math class and I wasn't in love with the textbook. It was just um, basically a series of lecture notes and worksheets that the professor had asked um, Wiley Custom Printing to spiral bound for him and then was being sold by the bookstore for $70 for this maybe 150 page photocopy. I thought I could probably do better. So I decided to write my own stuff and I was just gonna do that. But then I heard about some of um, the OER initiatives and how people were, were sort of self-publishing books as a way to disseminate their work and also to make them look nice. So I, I spent a few years turning it into a book. Um, this is the current website for it. Um, it looks, uh, it start, sorry, it started as a um, entirely, entirely done in LaTeX, um, which worked fine. But then I heard about Pretext, which at that point was called MathBook XML. And um, this is a, a markup language, kind of similar to LaTeX, but it's actually written in XML, um, which perhaps is a little bit intimidating, um, at least initially. Um, but it, it produces really nice output formats. So, um, I wanted to show you a few of the features that I really like about it and talk a little bit about why I think having this sort of uh, um, a source format of a math textbook is valuable. So this is a page from, from my book. And um, you can see that I, I think the layout is very nice. This is all generated automatically from the XML code. If you're familiar with LaTeX, it's the same sort of process. You you write the markup in just plain text, and then you compile it into various output formats. And this is just the output format for HTML. You can also compile pretext into LaTeX and then into PDF to create physical copies of it. Um, in addition to the nice layout, the nice math that is done in MathJax, which is very good for screen readers. Um, there's a lot of attention paid to um, accessibility. Um, the headings are the right thing. For example, um, you can tab through this in a meaningful way if you have a screen reader. Um, we have nice features like the solutions to examples being hidden and then revealed when you click on it and then hidden again. Um, 
you have things like um, in the exercises, I mean, you have different types of elements, right? So you have the pretty blue boxes that you can get. Um, in the exercises, again, you have solutions um, that are hidden by default. You can also put answers and then have them in the back of the book. But that's all done automatically for you. So in the, the source that you write, you put the statement of the exercise and the solution right next to each other. And then you can tell pretext to compile it so that those go in the back of the book or maybe are not included at all in the final output. Uh, my book also has some web work questions. So you have some interactivity there. You can, you know, think what this should be, n squared. I can check my answers. That's not correct because um, I didn't think at all about what that might be. Um, so we have, have lots of those um, kind of features. Um, you get an index automatically. You just tag in the source what things should be in the index. And this is an example of a, an example of a situation where the open book is probably better than a physical textbook that you would get. Um, you want to know what ancestor meant? Well, there's the paragraph where that's defined. And you can get to that by just clicking on this and you don't have to jump back to the page and search for where on the page is that, for example. And you could click on in context and then it will navigate you to that spot in the correct part of the textbook. Um, this is a um, abstract algebra textbook that I'm teaching out of right now by Tom Judson. Um, I wanted to point out these kind of um, cross links here. In example 3.9, he uses proposition 3.4. And if you were in a math textbook, you don't, well, what's proposition 3.4? If you click on it, it'll have proposition 3.4 right there for you. In fact, it even has the proof of it there, which you can also expand, for example. Um, this textbook is especially nice um, because it has um, Sage embedded inside the textbook. So Sage is an open source competitor to MATLAB or Mathematica. Um, we can have code specifically ready for the students and then they can um, just evaluate it and they can modify the code too, right? So I want this to be integers nine. I could do that and then I get a different output there. Um, I know some of you are interested in graphics. Uh, this is the mathematics um, section here. Let's see, no, I'm short on time here. Let me just show you some of the graphics that we can get. Um, so this graphic, which I can drag around here just by clicking on it and moving my mouse, this was created in asymptote inside the source of the textbook. And you just put it in a figure command, and then you just write the asymptote code, 10 lines of asymptote code directly in your source. So this way, if someone else wanted to take your textbook and modify it, they could modify the source easily to get a slightly different image in their version of the textbook if they would like. You can put interactive elements in the textbook. Um, this might take a long time to load. Things um, authored in JavaScript. You can link in specific JavaScript. You can get uh, GeoGebra applets embedded. Um, in this case, there's even a little calculator. That you can pop up a, I think this is set up to be a GeoGebra calculator. It'll pop up here in a second. So you could um, use a GeoGebra calculator directly in your textbook. So there are lots of nice things um, about this in terms of the output format. The input, I think, is perhaps a little intimidating because you have to write XML. Um, I should say, and I should have made this clear at the beginning, I did not invent pretext. I've done very little with pretext. I've just used it. I have worked a little bit to try to make pretext easier for people to use. So if you use Visual Studio Code, for instance, I have a plugin that I wrote that allow, allows you to get a lot of the messy kind of markup structure um, much easier. You, you can just expand it with like some keys, some basic um, um, shortcuts. Um, so the source can be intimidating, but I think having the source and the markup available and editable is very useful. You can take individual parts of one textbook and move it into another textbook, include it in different textbooks. And if you would do that all at the source level, then the output looks very seamless and consistent. So that's my pitch. I know I'm out of time. I'd be happy to answer questions later, but um, thanks for listening. Thanks, Oscar, for walking us through your pretext textbook.
Um, I will now turn things over to Amy to describe her project. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, so I'm Amy Belia, and I'm again at Radford University, and this is actually my first time at office hours, so um, it's exciting to hear all about the cool things that are going on. Um, and I'm going to kind of go a little bit different. It, it sounds both my uh, colleagues here are talking more about textbooks, but we need to also look at other things like the laboratory, especially in the sciences. The sciences, uh, one of the things that are big for us is to write laboratory reports, to record our information down. And so at my institution, one of the things I started noticing with our students is they just could not afford your typical lab notebook, which is the essentially spiral bound notebook. And initially kind of how I got into this, because I wasn't an OER uh, and I didn't really know anything about it when I first started, I got an internal grant for a program called Lab Archives. And essentially it's an electronic laboratory notebook where the students would be able to write down information in their computer that of course every student has, well, most students have, or at least they have like me, my cell phone right there, sitting there. Um, and that they could go and record that information and I could look at that. The problem is, is lab archives cost $20 per student. And it's still, it's about the same price as what I would be on the um, paper copy. And so therefore what I decided to do was um, the Virginia, Library Association has something called a Viva Grant. So anybody who's in Virginia can do this. Um, and what they have is they've set aside money for people to be able to uh, adopt, adapt, or create OERs. And so I, as well as two colleagues, um, one in the biology department, another one in chemistry, came together and we decided to go with a program um, called eLab FTW. And it's kind of exciting, I can get to share the screen so you can kind of get an idea of it. Um, and there's a lot of, there's some electronic uh, open source notebooks available. Um, this is the one we decided on, which is eLab FTW. This is actually done through the, um, somebody in uh, uh, Paris and he keeps it updated. And what's great is that everybody gets a chance to you can download this, you can modify it any way you want, and then he encourages you to actually bring it back up to his website, and so we can get, continue to get these updates and changings of the different programs. And so the idea for this system, if you kind of want to see this here, is, um, I gotta move my little screen over. Um, so this is an example of the electronic notebook. And what's so great about this electronic notebook is one, students can use it on their PC, their Macs, their iPads, their phones, um, pretty much anywhere you want. So they can have it at all times. Another great advantage for this type of system, it's free for the students. And how I've set this up is that to keep security, because I'm actually, you can start to see, I'm actually using this also in my research labs as well, is that it is on my local network. So I've worked with IT to be able to uh, put that on the network. It's on a single sign-in system. So my students don't have to worry about getting, uh, trying to go through something or somebody trying to go into our system accidentally. And so, I'll kind of bring it down to one of the, the things that we've done. So um, yeah, we'll put this one. So this was a chemical reaction. And what my students can do is I have a template already for them. And they can come in and they can fill this information in. So we have amounts, milligrams, millimoles, things of that nature. They can go, we can, and I've kind of indicated what I want them to be able to write down. And then they're writing their procedures. Um, we might have some conclusions. My students can put in pictures. So, and so you can put the mathematical equations, you can type that in. It's a little bit more time consuming, but students can upload pictures. They can upload files, Excel files, um, pretty much almost anything they want. They can draw chemical structures on this program for people who are interested in chemical structures. And at the same point, they can comment. 
uh, or I can comment on their work and I can allow sharing between students so I can control all of this information. So it's a great collaborative effect. It's also getting our students prepared for the field, not just in chemistry or biology, but whether they're going to the pre-med track, whether they're going into jobs or anything of that, they need to understand the technology. So I can talk more about that, but I notice I'm also out of time. Um, but um, I appreciate you guys listening. Thanks, Amy. We appreciate you walking us through the electronic notebook. And now over to you, Delmar. <clears throat> um, thank you. Okay. Um, it's difficult for me to figure out what to talk about. Um, so I wear multiple hats. Uh, so I'm, I'm a chemist, uh, uh, which means obviously I teach chemistry. Um, uh, I am the founder and the director of the Libertex project. Um, and if you've Googled anything in anything, you come across our site. Um, so we just reached uh, 500 billion page views uh, last week. Uh, that's with a B. Um, and we have approximately 1 million pages per day uh, and four millennia of student uh, reading. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and we're growing hyper exponentially right now. The, um, but I also uh, am as an instructor, uh, I not just facilitate and build OER, but I also use it in the classroom, uh, which means that I'm sort of a different beast than many of the other directors out there. Um, and then I'm also co-director of an OER project uh, program at my campus, uh, being a, a large University of California campus is gonna start to expand into the greater um, infrastructure in, in California. So I'm excited about that. So uh, I figured that my take was supposed to be talking about my experience in building a book. Now, the thing is I've built a handful of books uh, used in a variety of my classes. In fact, five years ago, six years ago, when I got back from sabbatical, uh, I told my chair that I was never going to be uh, using a commercial book again uh, in any of my classes. Uh, and that basically made my life really painful for several years uh, as I needed to do what I refer to as writing the wave, which is building the book at the same time that I'm using the book, which is an unbelievably painful process, uh, at least the first time that you're doing it. So let me mention uh, uh, just the LibreText, one slide of the LibreText, and then I will transition into my experience off of that. So the LibreText project, um, it is, is actually part of a greater ecosystem that I refer to as the Libreverse. Uh, and it has a core content of libraries, which are based around a wiki-based technology that we then augment with a variety of different features. In fact, most of the features that o Oscar mentioned we have available, um, and a few of the features that uh, we don't have that uh, Pretext has, which I really like their technology, uh, we are uh, gonna come out soon off that. But we have this ancillary set of components that are part of our our Libreverse, including a homework system, running it uh, summatively involving either WebWork or IMath AS, which is basically Ohm's technology from Lumen or uh, Open uh, My Open Math, uh, with H5P and such in a in a more summative approach. We have a Jupyter notebook system which lets us run. 30 different uh, languages of executable code bound into our text, including SageMath, which Oscar mentioned, but Python, R, Octave, and a handful of other languages, most of which I've never heard of before, to be honest. Uh, we have the ability in order to store a range of a JavaScript servers, learning analytics. We have a bot server in order to go through the content in order to update uh, the uh, content in the libraries based off of current or new uh, accessibility requirements forums and a few other things off of that. And I could talk for a very long time. In fact, right now I'm in the middle of a Librafest, which is our meeting um, uh, that we're, we're doing this quarter off of that. So let me uh, jump into uh, my the class I'm teaching right now, which is my quantum mechanics class. Uh, so the key point that, uh, that I think uh, we all agree on here is that the textbook of the future involves technology uh, and it needs to bring in advanced features in order to be able to enable that. Uh, <clears throat> Um, and uh, I use my textbook, quote unquote, as an integration between a textbook and a learning management system, where I have a component that's an agenda that students can go to in order to identify what they need to do and read off of that. I have my textbook uh, here. I have lectures and I have worksheets. Uh, and this is, for example, the textbook that I've created. I could take it, spit it out in PDFs and uh, physical copies and a variety of other uh, formats off of that. <clears throat> so, for example, the uh, Schrodinger equation particle in the box, um, you can click to it and go through it as full 
searching capabilities uh, and uh, interactivities. And we've been going through video, going through manipulating the equate, not the equations, the uh, figures to be SVG. So they're fully vectorized and scalable and such like that. Um, but then you want to be able to uh, do some advanced features. Uh, so this is executable code for a particle in the box. Uh, so this is running Python, uh, which I can then uh, engage in this more Socratic uh, investigative approach where I have questions and students can come in and the kernel died out. So it's going to take a few seconds in order to pull up the kernel because it's a massive infrastructure in, in, in activity. Um, and I probably didn't do it in the right order, so uh, I would need to refresh it. Um, we can also inter uh, embed interactive code. This right here is a particle in a two-dimensional box. I'm getting very quantum mechanical, uh, where you can change quantum numbers, and you can see the synced up between the wave function and the learning thing. This is using my uh, calcplot 3D, um, which is a different technology than what was discussed uh, in Oscar's talk, um, but it has similar cap similar features off of that. Uh, <clears throat> we bring these things all together as learning objects so they can go into a repository in order to identify the content, pick and choose and build your textbook uh, as needed. The last thing I'll mention is the homework system. This is the homework system. I'm logging in as a student because um, if I logged in as an instructor, you'd see names and that's a violation of VERPA and such like that. Uh, so this is the homework system that essentially acts as an abstraction layer that we use different technologies behind it. So we have, um, you know, MyOpenMath, WebWork and H5P and there are other technologies that will be embedded into it. And the idea is that each one of these technologies has its own unique uh, uh, implementation, its own grade book, its own uh, uh, LMS, uh, uh, and some of them are painful. Some are poorer developed than other uh, ones. Some are actually not even fully accessible. Like most of H5P examples are not don't meet accessibility requirements in California, uh, <clears throat> um, and uh, and other things. Uh, Mom took all the chargers. I'm yeah, I'm talking. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and other technologies that come out here. So what we do is we essentially gut everything, have a central grade book that's able to use different technologies uh, as needed, and it's the same technology. So as an instructor, you have the same uh, interface that you work with it. As a t as a student, you have the same interface, irrespective of the technology you use. So in other words, you pick the technology, you select the technology that's useful for the specific question uh, that you want. To to use and you don't need to worry about the complexities without using one versus the other. Obviously there are issues regarding making those problems which is a very technology dependent system but this provides a centralized infrastructure in order to facilitate its adoption and adaption. Uh, it runs summatively, it's, we, bound, we can bind them into our pages. In this case here we're, we're independent or outside of it uh, and then you can go into this is an H5P problem that's embedded into it. Um, these are largely open-ended questions because we both can grade them online, but also provide the opportunity for more advanced questions that you really can't do automatically. But I wanted to implement it into our system so that they can uh, students can upload answers, keys, and, and start to grade off of that um, uh, and such. So. Uh, I will end. Uh, I'm sure that was a few minutes more than I, what I need to talk about, uh, and I can certainly go into any of these discussions as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Delmar, and thanks to our three guests. So this is when we turn things over to the uh, 35 or so of you who are here with us in the call. Please feel free to unmute or post a question in the chat. Uh, while you do that, I'll get things going and ask uh, of, of the three of you, you know, have you had conversations with your, your colleagues or others who might be interested in OER? And if so, how do you pitch or explain the tools that you use in your classroom? Or how do you um, talk about that with your colleagues as something, I don't know, they might want to explore? Okay, well, so um, yes, uh, we, they definitely know. So we have here, uh, we got an HHMI grant to work with uh, trying to give more accessibility to our students working on more students being able to feel welcome within it. And so I, this is something that I talk about a lot with my fac the faculty there involved in that. And this is your math science classes and things of like that. Um, I think they are excited. They're still waiting on what's going on here, but they, whether I've done this or I've been working with, um, I, I do still use a traditional textbook, but I have uh, dramatically cut the cost of that textbook for these students now. So now it's more of a, no, uh, a low OER or rather than um, no cost. Um, and so, yeah, they're 
it the conversation is very they're more curious than anything else and they're cautious at this point but i i think it's positive thanks amy our department is very pro oer in general um, in fact the math department just won the state of colorado zero textbook challenge award for this year the first time it was offered um, so we do a lot of stuff, but I, I think that it started because of a few people who thought that it was a good idea from mostly a cost saving perspective, right? We see our students struggling with the decision of whether to buy a textbook or buy food that week. And, you know, that's not a good idea um, to make them make that choice. Um, and then students don't buy the textbook or they, you know, even if it's a cheap textbook, they can't get a hold of it right away and then they're behind. So th those kind of issues were really a good way to sell, try an OER textbook. And then showing them that there are really good ones out there um, that can be, that are better perhaps than the commercial counterparts even, um, I, I think is a good way to um, get people to look into them. Is it my no, Sure, um, I invite you to speak to that. And then also there's a question from Stephen Bell in the chat asking what adapt means. He hasn't noticed that before. Yeah, it's still new. Um, in answer to uh, buying in, uh, there is no one successful buy-in mechanism as probably everyone on here knows. Uh, the different clientele, different uh, colleagues have a different uh, reception associated with that. Uh, I would be lying if I said that my colleagues in my department uh, are overly receptive to OER, uh, which is not the case. So it's a, an uphill battle uh, that I've had for a long period of time. Uh, and I expect it to be an uphill battle largely in large R1 institutions uh, where their priorities are oftentimes focused uh, at least uh, not necessarily exclusively, but certainly significantly toward research rather than education. Um, so in order to answer that question, it takes a, it's, that's a multi-hour uh, thing in order to do. Uh, the, the, the guiding principle behind how we operate is that we have a team of undergraduate students, or at least a guiding principle, uh, that are involved in what we call harvesting, which is bringing in existing content that we then update and, and augment and improve uh, as needed. Uh, but those uh, students also provide an opportunity in order to do, let's call it grunt work uh, activities for faculty. So when a faculty has an interest in saying, well, I want to do it, but it takes too much time, then I say, that's fine. Here is a student mm -hmm. uh, and that student will uh, do as much of the grunt work as possible in order to move it forward. So the idea in order to make this thing work on our level is to remove as much pain as possible uh, if we're doing that. And that requires building an infrastructure that's easy to use, easy to manipulate, easy to find the content, uh, and so that the students don't have to do that. The next step is to get the dean uh, uh, get buy-in at the dean level in order to provide uh, top-down uh, encouragement for that. And some deans are more enlightened than other deans in, our, uh, in OER in order to pursue that. Um, but we're slowly making progress on my campus. Um, and we saved millions of dollars so far uh, uh, just on our campus alone. Uh, uh, but it's such a large campus, we have lots of opportunity for expanding. Um, oh, there was another question. Uh, what was the other question? I'm sorry. Adapt. Uh, adapt. <laughs> oh, ADAPT. Uh, so a ADAPT is a project that's supported by the state of California. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, we got the grant at the start of summer, um, and it, we've had the intent in order to build a homework system for a long time. In fact, it was part of this grant that we received from the Department of Education two years ago, but we were slowly moving forward because we didn't want to just replicate the wheel. We can bring up web work and run it, uh, uh, or bring up IMATH and run it uh, exclusively. We wanted something far more powerful, more flexible, in order to handle the future uh, rather than uh, the present. Uh, <clears throat> so that took a little bit of time. This grant that we received uh, was designed in order to do two things. Uh, uh, is to build a homework system that is adaptive, uh, in introduces adaptive learning into it that's freely available for students. So we have an infrastructure, uh, which I didn't show, that we can uh, build uh, learning trees. So we can start to identify assessments, uh, remediation nodes, whether they happen to be text or, or, or video, or even Socratic uh, 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 interactive uh, systems, and start to build a, an infrastructure. You can think of it 
simplistically as a choose your own adventure story that basically follows through the needs of the students based on their, their responses off of that. Uh, and that's available uh, now. Uh, we've, again, we're three, seven, no, four, five months into it. And we already started testing out my quantum mechanics class. Um, the second thing, which is exceedingly important and we're very excited about is to start to implement culturally responsive pedagogy into the infrastructure that we put into here. So you can start to provide uh, contexts. So when you have videos, uh, uh, not every video is an old white guy talking about uh, science, which is invariably almost everything that's involved in science. Uh, so start to bring in the, uh, the, the greater context of marginalized scientists that have been marginalized because of their gender or their race or their um, ethnicity, uh, uh, or if it's a nationality or even their uh, sexual uh, proclivities uh, and start to try to realign uh, and realign the, the the homework system, we're going to then fold that back into the textbook system so you have this thing, but you need to do it so that it doesn't get in the way and it's not contrived. And, and a lot of the things are just largely contrived stuff that many faculty just throw away from the textbooks because it gets in the way of what we're trying to, to do as a scientist. Obviously in sociology books is a different story. So the idea is to find the right mix and, uh, uh, of trying to introduce it, but not make it so students and faculty say, no way, Jose, uh, in order to be able to do that. So that culturally responsive component is baked in, is being baked into our system. So for example, when you have a question up that uh, focuses on solubility of lead, uh, pH dependent solubility of lens. So if you haven't, if you're not up on it, that's a common ion effect uh, system. I'm not going to switch into a lecture, um, but that's particularly important when you want to talk about what's going on in Flint, Michigan, and the minority population that's adversely affected because they've dumped a massive amount of lead into the pipes because of the pH off that politics aside. Uh, so you can start to provide lots of context off of that with these problems. If you do it right, so it's not getting in the way, I think we can start to augment agency, self-efficacy, and hope to try to reduce this leaky pipeline that we have of minorities as they start from um, uh, undergraduate school to the time that they actually become professors or, uh, or upper or professional um, individuals. So that's ADAPT. Um, you can contact me, I can certainly tell you more about it. Thanks, Delmar. Um... Uh, also a question from Steven was about whether or not students are at all interested in print versions of these resources that any of the three of you have created and provided. And if so, are they available and how do students get their hands on print? I think Oscar was commenting on that. Um... Yeah, and so, um, you know, if you can create a PDF version you can um, self-publish it through a variety of you know, print-on-demand services. I use Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing, and it sells on Amazon for $14.50. Students can have a physical copy of it. Some of them like that. Um, my book, though, doesn't use a lot of the interactive features, right? One thing you can put in these books is you could put a YouTube clip of you doing an example right in the textbook, which is fantastic. But then how do you, how do you, I, what I don't know, and I still need to figure out is, how do you write a textbook that has that, but there's, it is still valuable as a print textbook that some students want? So that neither is really has an advantage or is missing out on features. Um, and I just don't know the right way to do that, so. You're not yeah. alone. <laughs> um, so uh, my answer to that question is, how we do it. So when we have the videos and we spin up a, a PDF of those videos, uh, we put a QR code uh, on top of those videos so you can actually scan it in order to do it. Because, but you're right, uh, the, the complexities associated with multimodal typesetting uh, it, and distribution is exceedingly painful in order to be able to deal with that because of the interaction. You gotta deal with that with some smart ways in order to do that. Let me mention something about our, our system. Um, any book that's put into our system, whether it's constructed by authors directly on it or that we've integrated it in from existing systems, uh, and we have an older version of Oscar's book and we wanna get the newer version, we just, and we have a, an importer set up for pretext. Uh, we just haven't implemented it because everything 
I can blame COVID, can't I? Is that good enough? Uh, so, um, so when a book is compiled, when it's ready to go, we have a range of uh, outputs, you know, PDFs, uh, common cartridges for embedding the learning management system. But more importantly, any book that we put into here goes into our automatic bookstore, which actually facilitates a, a purchasing a physical book uh, of that. Um, and, and that uh, happens directly. And this is uh, my internet is slow or something slow here. Um, so you can get a physical copy of your book. For example, here's my quantum mechanics book that I have here. And this one here costs $10. Uh, and this book cost is too big for Lulu Express and we need to be able to expand it. So any book that, uh, for example, 90% of the open textbook library is, uh, is integrated, at least the, the links that they go out to the resources they go out to, is integrated within our platform. Uh, so you can come in and you can get a PDF of that and it's all rendered and typeset in a variety of way. You build a book, you, it automatically gives you the opportunity in order to spit out a PDF, give a link out, and then students can, uh, can directly um, purchase the book uh, at cost. Uh, that way we don't need to handle any issues associated with non-commercial clauses of our content, minus like 5% for keeping it up uh, and such, uh, and, um, um, and such. So we're very happy about the, the, the sort of printing capabilities that's on the fly and automatically given to any resources that we have available. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm, I wasn't planning on talking about it, so I, I'm, I'm still kind of looking around for it. <laughs> um, so I know for us, and, and this is, it's an interesting how you guys are doing it. We're not allowed to let our students go to an outside source like this. We are actually required to have our students go to the bookstore. And so of course the bookstore is gonna charge a lot more for a printed copy. Um, and it's, it's in our contract. And so it's interesting, what would you guys be able to switch? You know, how do you get around those issues? <laughs> Great question. There may be people here who can speak to that in the chat or, or by voice. Um, in the meantime, I'll also um, toggle over to Anne Marie's question in the chat, which is related, I think, to this print question. And that's whether your campuses address student hardware, software, and Wi Fi access gaps. Where she lives, they have limited broadband in so many areas, so offline reading is a necessity for some. You want me to go or? Anyone is invited to speak to it. I just don't want to dominate the conversation. Uh, uh, I tend to do that for some reason or another. Um, so uh, we take offline access to content very seriously and we have a range of different uh, mechanisms in order to facilitate that both in action uh, or what will be coming out uh, in the near future. So one can argue obviously that PDFs is one mechanism in order to do that, but you lack a lot of the capabilities, the, the things that make the textbook of the future, the future uh, <coughs> off of there. Um, and physical books have the same issue off of that, but that's technically an offline uh, dissemination mechanism. Um, uh, we have constructed, and this is part, developed in order to try to facilitate dissemination to developing countries, what we refer to as, text, as a Libra text in a box. And so it's essentially a Raspberry Pi box. I was looking for a photograph of it and I, it will take me a minute to pull it up and I don't want to, I have limited amount of time. So if you're unfamiliar with Raspberry Pi, it's essentially a computer that fits in the palm of your hand. Now, it's not a very powerful computer, uh, but it's still a computer. Uh, you can load it up with the right technology in order to uh, basically put our entire library on it. Uh, and then you can, uh, you can email it out. So if you not email it, <laughs> you mail it out to, uh, to people. Uh, so if you're in a developing country that has absolutely no internet infrastructure, you can get this box. And if you have a Wi-Fi available uh, uh, device, uh, you can plug this in and then you can access this. And it could be in a classroom in order to be able to disseminate that. What's clear with the COVID uh, situation is that there are a lot of students in America that have limited internet access, uh, either because the infrastructure is not there or they don't have the, the money in order to, to purchase it. Um, <clears throat> so there's a need in order to be able to implement these sort of things. What's going to be coming out soon uh, are two other manifestations of offline on our system. One is Libre Text on a Phone, which is an app that you can actually then download. Uh, but more importantly, it's not like downloading a PDF. It downloads uh, everything that you can run with JavaScript on our technology that doesn't require uh, server-side uh, capabilities. So unfortunately, web work and, uh, um, and IMATH require server-side capabilities. 
Theoretically, H5P does not, but it's not designed in order to operate like that. <clears throat> but a lot of the other JavaScript technologies that you embed into it, you can then uh, put into it. So you can pull on your phone and you can use the ac activities that you have uh, off of there. We have, an, uh, we have a collaboration with uh, EduWorks, which is an organization in, um, uh, in Oregon, uh, in order to make what we call Pebble Books, which will be EPUB 3, 3.0 compliant uh, um, uh, books. So it has those JavaScript components into it, um, which has largely still been ignored in EPUB outputs off of that. And it also includes all the web, all the uh, math jacks and the equations in order to make uh, Oscar's equations look pretty, which is important. Uh, that's integrated into, into that. Um, and then um, uh, I'll shut up. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Delmar. It's, it's great to hear all of the different ways that um, Libretex is looking to support learning. And Marilyn mentions another one in the chat, which is Rachel, which is there with a link. And I just want to um, invite again, anyone in this call, not only our three guests, if you have insight or examples about how your institutions or institutions you know of are addressing these issues, please feel free to share them in the chat. Um, there is another question here from Melanie. She is asking uh, what's available for organic chemistry in terms of open homework systems. She's heard the need for a good drawing tool um, is there and um, that it's often not part of existing homework systems and can be a barrier to adopting open textbooks for organic chemistry. So um, are there any, anyone in the call uh, who would like to speak to those homework systems? I see Amy nodding, so this might be a great chance for you to jump in, Amy. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree, there is not. I have looked pretty much with all these systems and I haven't seen anything yet. We're very fortunate our university uh, purchased a university-wide a license for ChemDraw. So we have ChemDraw, so, and our students can download that. Um, but yeah, the the, Chem, you know, you got chem doodle and stuff like that, but all that stuff still is, there's some money involved. So I have yet to really see anything. Unfortunately, that's, that's one of the things I wish would have, would change. Um, is that on the roadmap for you folks? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so I should mention uh, ISIS Draw or whatever ISIS Draw became uh, is freely available. And, and I've published multiple papers using ISIS Draw without requiring. But, anyways, um, uh, Open OCHEM uh, is probably the most advanced uh, OER based organic infrastructure out there. Uh, it's still a little uh, clunky um, uh, in, in its implementation. Um, we have a, uh, so the so as part of this grant that we got from the state, of, not the state, the, the, the US Department of Education is to build uh, all the OER textbooks to supplant uh, the textbooks for uh, an American Chemical Society degree from start to finish. Uh, so that includes the general chemistry, which is largely taking care of it, although we have to revamp a lot of the things uh, uh, for R1 institutions. Um, organic chemistry is a, is a bane in my side. I'm a physical chemist, not an organic chemist, um, if the quantum mechanics didn't tell you that. Um, but we also have a team for inorganic chemistry, analytical chemistry, and biochemistry, which is actively moving. So by the time the grant is over in two years, uh, we expect to have a pile, you know, yay high that can uh, take the place of that. So the organic chemistry people uh, are 100% on, uh, uh, in, on, concerned with the question that the, the original poster's question here. Um, the ADAPT homework system is designed to be, uh, to deal with what I call Frankensteins. So you can embed different things in order to be able to make uh, new systems up, uh, which I'm, I'm okay, I didn't, uh, I, it took me a moment to, to pull it up. So we have an example where we can ha embed uh, like JS mall or, or JL mall capabilities. So you can have like two enantiomers and then you can have a, a, a different system like web work or H5P that asks questions regarding it below there. So they're interconnected. That right there gives you the ability to do about 80% of the sort of questions that are typically involved in organic chemistry books. The problem is the questions that are in organic chemistry books are actually not nearly as good as they should be 
because you need to have more advanced capabilities and making mechanisms and reactions and things like that. And that's very complicated in order to be able to implement. Uh, but there certainly pushes off of that. My intent is that uh, I have a sub team of that sub team focusing on organic chemistry problems, bringing it into the adapt system so that everyone can capitalize and, and use it. And I expect to be able to test drive parts of that uh, this summer, whether it's early summer or late summer, I do not know. Thanks, Delmar. Oscar, you spoke to um, the learning curve, although you may have used a different term for pretext. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience, you know, writing and creating the book? Were you writing the wave, as uh, Delmar said, and writing it as you were teaching it, or did you spend some time uh, before teaching it? Yeah, I mean, so when I, I mean, the book evolved over a number of semesters teaching the course, and every time I teach the course, I. I have a problem and I have to just admit that I have a problem that I always want to mess with the book whenever I teach a course. The last time I talked to discrete math, I decided to completely reorganize the topics and do graph theory before counting. And so I wrote a new version of the book as I was going. So that's just the, apparently the way that I um, like to teach my classes. Um, initially, I wrote it all in LaTeX, which I was very familiar with. And then to get it in this newer format, I spent a summer to really learn how to do that and, you know, use, use some automated conversion tools to get me most of the way there. And now that it's in that nice format, now it's really easy to add things as I go or to, to make, you know, to rearrange things um, because I have, I, I'm familiar enough with the format that it's just copying and pasting code here and there and pointing to different things um, and pulling, you know, something from this other course that I taught that's kind of similar and, and dropping it in in the right place. So I think having good source allows you to ride the wave whenever you want to um, while you're teaching and to make things apply. In fact, this semester I'm teaching a graduate level graph theory class and it's only, I only have um, eight students, but the way we're running the class is that we are together writing our own OER graph theory book and everyone is contributing proofs to various things in pretext. I have to teach them how to do that, but they were able to figure it out in the first couple of weeks. So now they can all um, write stuff. They submit issues on, or submit pull requests to GitHub. It's all managed there. So we're creating this book um, in a very inquiry-based learning format, really uh, an open, I, mean, I think this is what open pedagogy should be, right? You're using open source ideas to actually improve your teaching. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that's really writing the wave since we don't have a textbook to start with and the students are doing it. And, and how many students are you working with on that project? So it's, it's just eight students in the class. It's a graduate, small graduate class. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not brave enough to try it with a larger undergraduate class yet. And, you know, um, when you moved from law tech to pretext, was there anything you were especially to say goodbye, excited to say goodbye to in law tech or anything you were especially sad to say goodbye to in law tech? So there is certainly a difference in philosophy LaTeX, even though it's not a what you see is what you get editor, you have a lot of control about, I want to cuss, I want to make this word bold, for example. In pretext, there is no bold command because bold is about presentation and your source should reflect the content. So instead you say, this is a term that I'm going to define, or this is something that needs to be emphasized. And then the processor determines what that should look like. And I think that's very important because different formats are going to have different ways of marking it up. One new feature, bleeding edge feature of pretext is you can now basically convert your source into Namath Braille. So you can create a complete Braille version of a textbook, something that normally costs like $50,000 to get a publisher's textbook transcribed into Braille. You can do at a push of a button now. That's only possible because the source is marked up in a completely semantic way without any formatting. But that takes a little getting used to because if you're used to saying, well, I want this to start on a new page, so I'm gonna have a command that says new page. Well, then you have to figure out how not to do that when you're writing your materials. But I think it's for the best. Yeah, it's, I appreciate how you illustrate the trade-offs that some authors may be frustrated and not being able to sort of uh, word by word format text, but the payoff of having everything at the source level is exactly as you said, that 
it's much more flexible and, and has greater integrity and structure. Okay. Amy, I wonder, go ahead. That, that, that's a beautiful uh, statement that uh, I would leverage that to a pet peeve that actually underlies much of the LibreText project in that uh, PDFs uh, are the opposite of that. We should not be storing our content in PDFs uh, because we can't do the sort of utility that's offered here. And far, far, far too much of uh, OER content out there is PDFs. That's why my team is ripping them apart in order to put them into a semantic infrastructure where you can do these sort of things. Yeah, it's true. There's a difference between uh, openness by license and openness in terms of technology and flexibility. Amy, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how your students interact with the notebook and if anything changed when you started using the notebook. Have you noticed any sort of pedagogical or, or um, engagement differences with your students? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I've definitely seen a difference. I think the students are actually more excited to go and work with the no electronic notebook than the paper notebook. Um, they actually probably know more about the electronic notebook than me because they found ways to do colors and bolding things and, and making it, you still want a traditional format, but at the same point, they can write things that are um, that kind of more like what they want. And I, my goal right now, because I teach organic chemistry, is not to have them be the perfect scientists. I want them just to be excited about science um, for my students. Um, they'll get that in physical chemistry and biochemistry and, and the upper level sciences. Um, and so uh, I've seen the one of the other things that I've seen is, is that um, they are spending more time wanting to understand the material. Ironically, even though it's a paper, you know, there's not much difference between what I'm doing in the paper and the electronic, but I'll get a lot more questions on, well, how do you do this? Or, you know, how do you do this calculation? Or I'm, I'm looking at this data. Or, um, a lot of students, uh, some of the students actually were even uploading videos. They loved seeing so a reaction occurring, so they videotaped that, and then they put that on there. So the engagement level went up, I saw, in terms of that. Um, Grading-wise, um, I liked it. Um, there's things on there that um, I haven't completely explored, but if you're concerned about students maybe writing in their lab notebooks after a certain time, you can put deadlines on there. You can put um, timestamps so that when they're writing things, uh, and so, uh, I've kept it a little open on that because uh, the first few times they just want to need to get comfortable with the program, but uh, the learning curve for them is very flat. That they don't, even though it's a new program, it's an app, and these students understand apps. They don't understand uh, coding, unfortunately, at this point. So, um, in in general, most of the stuff has been positive. Only one or two have complained to me that they wish they went back to the original format. And and I've been doing this now for uh five semesters so i would say that's a pretty good reason that they're, they're, they seem to pretty much enjoy it and then they have a copy of this for their entire career if they want to go back and put it into their um uh you know the, the electronic portfolios now they can just plop it right into there so yeah it's been very good very exciting yeah it does sound exciting cool well, I know there's a lot of chat going on in the chat. Uh, looks like about Rachel and other open pedagogy projects. Are there other questions um, that any of you want to surface from the chat or unmute and ask directly? Amy, what was the name of that technology you're using again? It's called eLab FTW. Um, there's a link I put in the chat for that program. Thank you. Okay. I think that was an adequate pause, but if not, feel free to interrupt me as I segue into our closing comments. Um, so, on behalf of the Open Education Network, it's always a pleasure partnering with the Rebus community and Aperva on office hours. And please join me in thanking our three guests and the stories that they shared about 
creating math and science resources. We were joined today by Oscar Levin, Amy Balia, and Delmar Larson. If you have ideas for future office hours, please let us know. And um, Aperva, I'll hand things over to you for any closing comments. Thank you, Karen, and thank you to all three guests for sharing um, their experiences and sharing a plethora of tools with us. I'm sure there's a lot of um, reflecting back in the chat and looking up some of these resources that we'll be doing. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to thank everybody who joined us um, at the session today. Um, thank you for contributing your questions, reflections, and thoughts. Um, and as always, it's a pleasure to coordinate with the Open Education Network on these sessions. Looking forward to seeing you all hopefully next month. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Cheers.